Start. Don Server, editorial writer. I'm Brad McElhenney, managing editor of Computer Week. Paul Fallon, county reporter. And your friend, editor, Anna Maurice, the program. You'll notice that, that we're. Uh, we're giving you the audience you deserve. We're giving you a, a while. Uh, and we've had some success this week. We started live streaming this week. We've been live blogging all along with these sessions. And we've got a small but deeply interested audience. Your, your son uh, debate was uh, lively. Yes, yeah, see, you're, you're one of the deeply interested persons, perhaps. I, I have a problem with being <coughs> interested in things like that, yeah. to the chagrin of my family. Yeah. You know, we go back to the newsroom, and some of our reporters, you know, are just, they're all reacting. It's been really interesting to watch it unfold. We've got to give Brad a lot of credit for it. Um, he's mm -hmm. driven the effort. But Paul is, um, sessions on the record, Paul is live blogging, right? Yeah, which I'm is important. hard to do because he has to write cogent sentences rather than taking fast notes. Okay. So, but he said he's also recording. Talk slower than normal. He's got a recording um, and he will write a story for tomorrow's paper. Sure. So we'll let you uh, make a brief opening and then we'll get into the discussion. Well, my name is Kent Carker. I've had the privilege of serving Fennell County for a number of years as County Commissioner. I'm running again simply because uh, I was asked to by a lot of people. Uh, the normal political line is there's much to do, we have more things to do. I, I think we do. It's been a very, very difficult the last three or four years. This has been the worst economy this country has seen since the Great Depression. Uh, I think to some extent, it, uh, it was. Uh, impacted uh, in, a, in a larger way because jobs are different than they were back in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, obviously. And it's much more difficult to jumpstart things when it's more of a technical aspect and the jobs are different. And uh, I certainly didn't live in that period of time, but I've read some history on it. So we've had to do things differently. It's, it's very difficult now to pay for the same services with the income that you get in a family or a business or a government. So that's really the challenge. And everyone running for office has promised jobs. When we had the great airport debate, I think they were uh, promising 100,000 new jobs that uh, if they build a new airport, and they asked me how many jobs I would promise if we kept it, and I said zero. And they made a big deal about it, especially in uh, Huntington and so forth. But my final answer on that was because you've promised every job there possibly is, there's none left to hand out or promise. So it's easy to promise jobs, it's hard to do it. The, right now, I think the challenge of local government, state government, and the private sector who actually creates jobs, real jobs, is to hang on to what we've got, do the best we can, blunt some of these unnecessary forces that are causing jobs to be lost or moved. And you see that all over the eastern part of the United States. That's what happened in Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky. Uh, we know there's a transitioning of uh, jobs, and we need to deal with that, anticipate it, and work with everyone. So that's why I'm running again primarily. The city has seen something of a turnaround in DNO uh, revenues. The county doesn't collect DNO revenue. Uh, your your basic revenue source is property tax. Am I correct? Uh, that's the, the bulk of it. Yes, there are other incomes, utility taxes, taxes from uh, table games. Uh, they don't call those taxes. They're taxes of public income, right. things like that. But by, by far, the majority comes from uh, property tax, and that's the way it's been since the feudal days. It's kind of a feudal system. But are you seeing the, the same increase, or do you think that'll happen on a delayed basis? It's not as responsive as the DNI. I've written the county budget, pretty much. Well, the accountants put it together, I, I looked at the policy, and of course all three county commissioners have to approve and vote on it, but we anticipated four or five years ago that we were gonna have a difficult time. And we voted without anybody suggesting it, without anybody, we cut positions, we cut spending, it's all clear, there's no doubt about that. Way ahead of time, or like a lot of counties around the country, uh, we did not have to lay people off or cut drastic services, but we came pretty close. Uh, to answer your question directly, it's better. We were able to give for the first time in five years a very modest increase. It didn't even come close to what the employees had lost over the last several years, but unlike the federal government, uh, we live within our means and 
don't spend more than we bring in. It's pretty simple, hard to do, easy to say. Did, but you have you seen more employee turnover in the last few years? Well, sure. Uh, uh, you always have some employee turnover, but at the same time, even though the salaries aren't high, and even though we haven't been able to do the things for our employees I'd like to do, if someone makes twenty-five or $30,000 a year, remember, they also have a significant benefit package. It's worth about $15,000 as a retirement. You know, we have uh, uh, a very generous retirement, although it's been cut back a lot by the state. We don't have what we used to have. Uh, we have very good health insurance, which frankly, uh, I have explained to the employees, most of them understand that and appreciate the fact that they can get a raise every year, small amount, but if their insurance premiums eat that up alive, they've lost because it calls it pre tax. So where do you, um, when you have turnover, where do you lose these employees? Because those are very, very nice benefits. We lose employees like every place does. We lose them from every agency we have. However, uh, I haven't run a, a statistical analysis on it lately. I consider some jobs what I call starter jobs. You know, someone will get out of school and they'll take a job and they know they're going to get a fairly small amount of money for the benefit package. And believe it or not, when I was 20, 23, 24 years old, that's a long time ago, I wasn't thinking about retirement and I wasn't thinking about health insurance. I was thinking about getting a little bit more money. So you have people naturally will move on when they take that experience, resume power, and other opportunity. People tend to change jobs these days seven, eight, nine, ten times. So uh, I do not believe we're underpaying people. Uh, I would like to pay our employees more, but I'm not going to go out and spend your money on something that's A, not affordable, and B, you just shouldn't do in a difficult economy. Tell me about the health package. Well, uh, I, I can. First of all, we don't have health insurance. We, we pay uh, the bills, basically. We have a uh, gatekeeper, uh, uh, the Blues, Blue Cross, we've had them for a long time and bid it out. At the bottom line, uh, it costs the uh, employers so much. We've done charts on that, Paul's seen them. I, uh, he's seen too many of my charts, but uh, I can't tell you the numbers off the top of my head, but I can tell you we more than meet the national government or private sector average when I got there, we did, when I say average, what the employer pays, what the employees pay, we have we have brought that to where it's supposed to be. I can give you some numbers specifically later. Off the top of my head, I'll probably be wrong, but I think <coughs> the employer pays about 60% or 80%, something like that. Employee pays about 20%. To specifically answer your question, is a very, very good health plan. And but you're self-insured, is that what you're saying? We are self-insured, absolutely. The insurance have company a, crosses your claims? Yes, they're the gatekeeper. And we're self-insured, but we've got uh, uh, a reserve package. If a claim comes over so much, off the top of my head, I think it's $70,000. There's a name for that. They come in and pay a catastrophic loss. If you get too many catastrophic losses, you can't, uh, your premiums go up like anything else. It costs the county taxpayers about $5 million a year to uh, have the uh, insurance uh, package. Now, let me just say this. Assuming you're going to have health insurance, assuming you're going to have benefits, you're better off having a plan that's affordable to the employees or they want access health care before things get out of hand. That's why we do preventive uh, measures are called wellness, but you know, physicals. We made it mandatory. We did that in the last several years. Mandatory for the employees, not for their spouses yet. We're going to move to that. Uh, we thought we would have a revolt on that. I've given Danny Jones and City Charleston credit for that publicly. They did that first. Uh, it was very, a very good thing to do. We were going to do some more wellness by bringing in doctors and so forth like they did. And the economy just tanked, and we were re really reluctant to, uh, to do that. But that's basically our health care package. It is expensive, but it's very good. And frankly, I think we've saved funds by preventing catastrophic illnesses that could be avoided. And you said $5 million. What's your total budget? Well, I was afraid you were going to ask that. Uh, <laughs> off the top of my head, I think our total budget is about $50 million, but that doesn't mean a thing because 
what what's the budget for? So much for salaries. Each agency gets like I think the sheriff's department gets about ten, eleven million dollars out of that. And they're, remember, they're independent constitutional officials, which means once you give them their budget, they really don't need you till next year most of the time. But we got very good elected officials, and they've been very, very sensible. But we cut back and didn't do raises. But we cut back and asked them to cut positions. You didn't have a single elected official in Kanawha County. I'll just use the word "cry baby" around. They could have. They could have come in and played games and blamed it on me or the commission, and uh, thrown in you know huge requests for pay raises, and then said, "Look, they they uh, they went out and spent two hundred thousand dollars to bring four people water. What do you think of that?" But the truth of the matter is, when you spend money like that for water, it's called 80% of it. You sleep with the federal grant, and it extends a water line. It might bring four or five jobs in. But they've been very good not to do that. So if you're going to have health care, it's expensive. Now, in the past, I have suggested we ought to take a look at going on the state uh, 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 health care system. I believe it's cheaper. It, it's not like watching a presidential debate. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, one person says it costs five trillion, and the next person says it's free. Now, somewhere between five trillion and free, there ought to be the truth, but I don't know where the truth is on that. But I believe that if you want decent employees, there's two or three ways to keep them. One is have them a decent uh, package. And I think health insurance is critical to retain our vets, especially those that are in high risk situations law enforcement, paramedics, people like that. They're in a high-risk health situation. Now, does that mean they're more important than our clerks? Never said that. But their chances of getting and real physical trouble is generally a little higher. But you know, natural disease uh, uh, situations hit everybody. I've learned that lately in my own family. Um, what about county uh, retiree health costs? Do you have some who? Some people who retire before Medicare eligibility. They, uh, they go off of our. Uh, they go off of our plan. They don't have it. Our plan is different than other plans. That's why it's still affordable. Uh, it's a little draconian. There was a time when PEA, PEIA allowed that public employees insurance agency. Um, they cut that out. Uh, speaking for me, I could have uh, taken my retirement last year or so and had free uh, health insurance for life. Now I won't have it. I'll have to work and stay on uh, some plan to keep insurance till I'm 65. I'm working on that every day. I'm getting there. I'm 60. But still, that wasn't right. I, I frankly was surprised there wasn't a lawsuit filed about that. But the county did that years ago. Uh, Commissioner Bloom and others did it. And at the time, it didn't get a lot of attention. PA sued the county, and then we settled that case. But what we did has saved the county, I continue to do it, has saved county taxpayers millions of dollars. Now, the way it worked, um, we had an excellent health insurance plan, still do. But once the employees uh, retired, they went on the PEIA plan. Now, we have to pay so much money a year, and I think it's a half a million dollars a year for retirees that are on that. That's going to go down now because they can't get on it like they used to. But it was still a huge cost savings to the county. The state, after 15 or 20 years, figured that out, but stopped it. So, are you seeing retirement slow down? Do you think county employees yes. are going to work longer? Yes, now? which will drive our health care costs up. But that's their right to do that. What, what about the tech center? Moving on to. What's the latest on that? What do you hope to do with it? Well, it was predicted to be a total miserable white elephant flock, right? Yeah. Everyone thought it was by very smart people, by the way. Do what? By very smart people. By very smart people. Uh, I can't remember your editorial position on that, but I think I do. I wrote a column expressing great skepticism. <coughs> I, I take the heat. I still I read your old editorials. <laughs> um, it was a risky venture. Let's look at the alternative. Let's just look at the alternative. How would we feel right now if that all those buildings had been raised? And they were going to be raised, they were going to be torn down. Don't don't let anybody come in here and argue, oh well, no, if the government had to come in, the front no, that they had to bulldoze those warmed up, and those folks were very serious about it. They were going to raise the property. Let's just talk about that. There are some 
real activity going on there right now. Now, is there enough? There'll never be enough. But I think it was the last chance to retain something that was an incredible facility. The one company that's down there now um, has some of they, they've taken advantage of all the scanning equipment and the computer equipment. We gave them an award the other day. So now, was that a lot of jobs? Oh, just 30, 40 jobs to pay about seventy to hundred thousand dollars a piece. Is that close to the investment the state made? Not even close. But if you assume that the national economy will turn, if you assume that there's going to be an immigration influx in this country, if you assume that manufacturing can come back to the United States, if we stop this, this ridiculous idea of having a tax situation that encourages people to go somewhere else, we pay for it and buy things from them that they're making somewhere else, but it's a new economy for this area. We'll never be Silicon Valley, but I think it's, it's a chance. I supported it uh, and meant that the county would lose a tax base. Now, let me talk about that a minute. What if we had supported that? What if then Governor Manchin, now Senator Manchin, <coughs> and others hadn't done that? Does that have any effect, you think, maybe on the Gestamp plant opening up pretty soon? I think it does. I think it sent the right guaranteed success no. But this is one time if the government, in this case the state and the feds, hadn't moved in, those buildings would have been level and the tax base was going to go anyway. How many big buildings do you need for a flea market? Which is exactly what the South Charleston stamping plant said before. If you haven't been in it, you won't believe it. You would be convinced you are in another state maybe even in another decade in the future. It is truly state-of-the-art. It's beautifully done. Um, I take little credit for that. I give most, if not all, the credit for Ray Park in the private sector. And then, spinning off on that, who would have thought the state of West Virginia was going to be able to compete with Ohio and beat them on stamping plant? Well, we did. In Mr. fact, Park. Ohio, <laughs> Ohio's lost two stamping plants at the same time, as I understand it. Mr. Park bet on it. Do <laughs> what? Mr. Park bet on it. Mr. Park. So I give the private sector great credit, but also remember that building was also going to be demolished. Yeah. Then Governor Manchin, we went to Governor Manchin, he sat down as he's prone to do and got a whole group of people. The state, for the second time, put money into keeping it there. What if they hadn't done that? We wouldn't have been in a, uh, uh, a match for uh, a stamping plant for Ohio because we wouldn't have had a facility to put it in. They wanted that facility right now. They wanted it today, if not yesterday. That's why I say I think the tech park has great potential. Whether it'll be a failure or not remains to be seen. What's the saying, uh, Don? There's, uh, when there's a failure, you've got uh, no uh, uh, fathers or something. Failure, success Failures in order. So if it's if it's a failure, I'm sure we'll get the blame for all the money we wasted, just throwing money at uh, picking winners and losers and that type of thing. I think the stamping plant is an excellent example of where the government got it right for a change. Now, how much money the government put in on that stamping plant, I don't know, but you're talking about 700 jobs. 700 jobs. 700 jobs that pay generously. Now, does that make up for the 30,000 coal jobs that were lost in the eastern part of the county over the last 30 years, no. But where did those jobs go? They went to, to mechanization. That's what did that. It wasn't a bad uh, labor market, certainly not like the coal. So things change and you've got to be, uh, you got to change. I, as a young man, I grew up in a public education. 80% of the kids in my class were white collar. Uh, uh, the parents were white collar, not white collar, blue collar workers, and half of them worked at the chemical plants. Mm -hmm. Right down there, Monsanto, DuPont, all the chemical plants. <coughs> uh, I remember when Kelly Axe made the best tax in the world, driving the tractor down at Dunbar, the uh, Libby owns Ford, uh, what was it, International Lead. I mean, those companies, mobilization and mechanization, went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you've got you to change with the times. You're also a West Virginia State graduate, right? Yes, and proud of it. And what do you think about uh, prospects under the new administration? Well, I had the privilege yesterday of Dr. Hemphill called me. This is the third time I've met with him. Uh, he is a turnaround 
change artists. I think there's more excitement, more innovation, more vision. Uh, I just hope he doesn't leave uh, in a short period of time or someone moves him on to a bigger, better opportunity. He is absolutely going to change the footprint down at Western Union State University. Very proud of the university. If you go into a room full of people and ask people, how many of you went from state or a family member graduated from state? It is amazing the impact that the university has in this community. Uh, Western New State never properly marketed themselves. Uh, Dr. Hemphill is going to do that. Very proud of him. It's exciting. Very exciting. You mentioned early, early on the sources of income for the county. Yes. And the new player in that is table games. Yes. How much revenue does the county now get from Well, if you remember, which I foolishly uh, announced I was in favor of when I ran the last time, uh, there was a tough vote on that. There was a threat that they were going to put it on the ballot this time. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen the uh, petition on that yet, but it may come up. If the, the, the folks in this county will vote that down, what I was in favor of is allowing the same people who voted for me to be able to vote on that again. If they want to vote on it again, uh, last time I checked, that's called democracy. The answer, the short answer is, the county gets about, from table games, there's two sources, well, there's three sources of revenue. One, property taxes, uh, personal and, and real property, which is a certain amount, I think it's maybe, uh, can ask my opponent that he might know, but I think it's three or four hundred thousand dollars for the property tax. I think off the top of my head, the uh, general revenue from regular uh, gaming down there is about a million, and from table games, it started out pretty low, about two fifty. And I think now when the law was changed, we fussed about the law. I think it's up to about half a million for the county. But remember, the city gets funds from that, and Nitro gets, I think, close to seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't know that for a fact. Why did I favor them? for two reasons. One, I was not a champion of putting it on the ballot to begin with. I didn't go ask the legislature to do it. The Kanawha County Commission didn't put it on our legislative list. It was put on the legislative list. It passed, and I told this newspaper then, and I will say the same thing now, I absolutely believe that once it was put on the ballot, everyone should take a position on it. If you hold a public position, I took a position on it. I met with the owners. I met with people who work down there, and all the things that people said was going to happen. You're going to have so much traffic, you couldn't drive through uh, cross lanes. Uh, I haven't seen that. Uh, uh, all the crime would go up. I, I think they had some people saying crime would go up, what, 100% or something? Well, I haven't seen that. Now, people legitimately disagree with gambling. Uh, is it, uh, I would rather have another two or three stamping plants on the same property. I'd be delighted. So if someone comes along and wants to put a couple of free stamping plants or another uh, high income uh, activity, but until they do, I think we should respect the, the will of the people. The will of the people of the state voted to allow that type of activity. It brings in a lot of out-of-state money. Remember the Ohio ads where they had the, uh, the Ohio license plates leaving the state to come to West Virginia to spend their money? Well. That part of it is good. A lot of it is out of state money. It's a challenge to the, they like to call themselves the gaming industry or the hospitality industry. The, the uh, challenge to the gambling industry is twofold. One, competition. Competition is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. You see that more in the northern part of the state with Maryland and so forth. Uh, the Greenbrier hasn't brought in near the money that they said they would. I thought it was interesting they changed the rules on the Greenbrier. Now, you don't have to be a guest there to play. I, I was I was stunned that got no advanced news coverage by anybody. Uh, I was kind of surprised about that. Apparently they had a meeting, put it on their agenda, put it on, it's done. But uh, that was one of the situations that they, I think, sort of promised. But at the end of the day, I think we ought to treat people like adults. And if folks want to do a legal activity, uh, gaming, it's a legal activity, I'll be allowed to do it. And, Shocked. I'm shocked to know that there's been gambling going on in West Virginia for 100 years. Back in the uh, late 1800s, they uh, bought a fire truck for Charleston by a uh, lottery that was passed by the legislature. Uh, 
there's been uh, tip tickets and football betting, and some people think there may still be some of that going on that's uh, not considered appropriate. So at the end of the day, I think adults should be allowed to do that. I think there's nothing wrong with it. It's the law, and they are a source of good jobs. Now, did they build the super huge things that at the time they said they were going to? No, they didn't. But I don't think they knew that there was going to be the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. I don't think they got the memo on that, and neither did I. So I think they're doing a good job down there. They haven't caused the problems people said they would, and it's a significant source of revenue. At the end of the day, if they shut their doors tomorrow, we would have to make up an immediate shortfall of an excess of a million and a half dollars, at least. Now you say, well, that's okay. Uh, it's easy to cut that. It's easy to do that. Well, I, I don't know how many deputy sheriffs that would be, or prosecutors, or things like that. It'd be a lot. So it's a valuable part of this community, and I think they've been a responsible, responsible corporate citizen. Do you think that they're going to be affected by the Ohio casinos? Yes, and that's why they're. Uh, if you look around the country, you'll be seeing them going back to the legislature, wanting this and wanting that. You know, in the gubernatorial debate, uh, there was this argument about how the state uh, is uh, uh, supplementing uh, Greyhound racing and how terrible that is. And Well, they're supplementing it with money that is totally coming voluntarily from those who choose to participate in it. And that's really not, not truthful when someone says that. But yes, uh, I think, not an expert on it, but I think it's proved to be known the uh, track would be glad to get completely out of their uh, <laughs> dog racing business. But that's how they got their foot in the door to begin with, and some say sort of snuck around the Constitution. So that's the system, that's the law. You go to other states, you have these, uh, these uh, river boats that, that couldn't float across the river that are chained to the pole that really aren't a boat, but they need the statutory thing and uh, that type of thing. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, another thing that's come up recently is um, funding fire protection, yes. volunteer fire departments. We have how many departments now? Oh, I think it's like 27, 26, something like that. Sounds terrible, except uh, I, I've gotten a lot of, I would say criticism. Why in the world should I, if I live in Charleston or South Charleston, why in the world should I have to support uh, a volunteer fire department, let's say Sissonville? Let me ask you a question. Do you ever drive through Sissonville in your life? Do you ever go to Sissonville for watch your grandchildren uh, play a ball game? How about Morgantown? you ever drive to Morgantown? Well, if you're on the way to Morgantown and you have a bad car wreck, which about one out of seven families will have a fairly serious event in their lifetime, gee, the Charleston Fire Department is not going to answer that call. They answer about 80% of all emergency calls in the state of West Virginia, statewide. Here it's a little less because we've got you know more urban population in the cities and so forth. Now, here's what's going on. Volunteerism is down across the board. Why is that? Now, why are less people going to the Lions Club and the different social clubs that we used to see? You couldn't get in the door at Rotary in the old days because we got soccer moms and dads, people have a different avenue of looking at things like that. We don't have the plants that had the ship work where it was actually set up to incentivize doing things like that. Plus, another news flag, a lot of people uh, can't afford not to work overtime or can't afford not to have an extra job. So the, the volunteerism in the fire service is down, but the, the activity has increased. So well, we don't have the population we used to. We sure have more traffic going through this county than we did in the 50s. That's what happened when you dump three interstates in the middle of the town without a ring around it. So at the end of the day, uh, we are close to a crisis with our volunteer fire services on funding. Why is that? Well, workers come. General liability insurance. What it costs to buy a, a SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus. A hand unit, uh, uh, 10 years ago, a little hand unit for a firefighter cost about three or $400. Some of the ones they have to have now cost about $3,600 at least. So the cost of going up 
and they really can't raise that kind of money by selling jelly and hot dogs. So we're going to have to take a look at that. Uh, Raleigh County uh, made a let the people vote. They didn't make anybody pay anything. They didn't raise taxes on anybody. They let the people decide whether or not they wanted to uh, provide more funding for their fire service. They passed it. Now the problem with Kanawha County is we have a levy right now that's had great success, especially the last couple of times it's been on file. <coughs> we have the KRT, and many of those counties don't have uh, public transportation, like Button County, for example. So we have the KRT and the ambulance levy, sharing the levy, and what we call, <coughs> excuse me, the public safety grant levy, which by itself provides about $750,000 of extra funds for the fire service and law enforcement. Now, my concern is whether or not another levy will harm that levy. If it even looks like it to me, I won't support it. But now, they can petition, meaning the fire service can petition, and get it on the ballot at some period of time, and they may well do that. I think their chances of passing it are less. What I say we need to do, Commissioner Hardy uh, is also uh, absolutely uh, uh, convinced it needs to be done first, and so is Commissioner Shores. Paul's covered that. I think he heard the discussion on it. We need to see, first of all, what are their real needs, not just wants, but needs. And two, uh, how much longer can this go on where their income is not meeting costs that they didn't put on themselves? Now, if that's not enough of a problem, they're having trouble just getting people to serve. Uh, and that's part of the lack of funding. And it's also part of just the world we live in. I've talked about it before. So I am afraid that it's going to become more and more of a problem. Now, some people think, well, you just got too many fire departments. Just, just consolidate them. Uh, get rid of half of them. Well, first of all, if you understand how this works, you, if you have a bad wreck at, uh, at uh, Pinch, you know, you've got two fire stations up there because the volunteers go to the station, get the truck, and drive at the wreck. So getting rid of one of their substations won't save you any money. Uh, 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 shutting down the Hanley Fire Department doesn't save the county any money because someone's going to have to drive farther and get there, and the response time will go down and down and down. Plus the interest in volunteerism, which is bad enough anyway, will go down. So it's like a lot of things. It's not quite as simple as it looks. It's a complex, difficult problem. It's getting worse. When you look at what happens in, in Sissonville, I mean, that's a major artery that one curve, just one accident mm -hmm. after another. Has there been any thought to the need for professionals or? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I, I, I would, if, if some of my volunteer <coughs> fire farmers were here, they would be uh, upset if you said they weren't professional. They had the same training. I use the and I'll be honest, like, well, it's, 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 it's a tricky thing. That's why they like to be paid in a, a non-pay career. They, it's, it's the same thing. I'm not fussing at you, but, you know, they have to have, that's part of the problem. The state, surprise, surprise, is putting all these mandates, understandable, to see to it that the public is protected as well as the, the, as the, the firefighters. And they have to meet or exceed uh, minimal standard. That's one thing that's causing a problem getting career, uh, not career, but uh, volunteer firefighters to do this. But it's not a problem at all. I've had that looked at. Do you have any idea what it would cost if we put a professional career fire department throughout this county? First, how many people would you need? And who'd pay for it? And what would it cost? I would suggest it would cost multiple millions. And then if you did that statewide, I don't know if you can count that higher. That's why we have volunteer fire services, because uh, folks don't want to pay higher taxes. I frankly never met a, uh, a, a snowplow uh, truck in the wintertime that I didn't like. But uh, you know, there are some things that you just really need. And uh, I used to tell people that in your lifetime, you know, there's three generally public uh, safety agencies that, uh, that will provide you something you're really critically going to need. There's uh, law enforcement, there's the fire service, and EMS. Now, 
Which one is the most important? Well, it depends on what's going on. If you're getting robbed, it's law enforcement. If your house is on fire or you're trapped in a car, they do more. They also do medical aid. They do lots of things. EMS, you know, if you're having a heart attack, I think you would, uh, if you could quickly uh, change the funding, you put all the money in EMS and take away the funding from the other. But that's not how it works in the real world. So statistically, in your lifetime, a medical crisis will be the most uh, common, life-threatening emergency that you will suffer. Now, that doesn't help you any if you get robbed at gunpoint, your house is on fire, but statistically, we put less money into the fire service than the other two. We, we just have firemen sit around, they eat uh, chili or cook spaghetti, and they don't do much, and uh, it's just kind of, I mean, my son-in-law is a career Charleston firefighter captain paramedic. He has three wonderful little boys, and he goes out. He has been in this river out here, which he could have not gotten back maybe, not returned from that job. He has to drive a vehicle. He has to deal with people with terrible disease. Uh, our firefighters, they're the best bang for the buck, both career and volunteer. We need to support them more. I'm not going to get off of that. This is something, if you looked at it and you had a decision to make, I think most people would agree we need to fund them, not only to protect us, but how about protecting them? So you think it's possible that Kanawha County will, will have, will see a fire fee on the ballot at some point? I think it's possible because it can go in there two different ways. It can go in there by petition or it can go in there by consent. But at the end of the day, let's say it's on there. Is there anything wrong with letting the voters decide? What's wrong with that? I've never seen your newspaper ever turn down a bond levy for the school system. And the reason is, you're, you're not forcing anything on anyone. You're allowing people to make a decision. Now, my concern, and it's not, not going to go away, if it hurts the ambulance levy, I'm against it. Because the truth of the matter is, we will be a less safe community. Our economy will go down if we don't have decent uh, EMS. The Kanawha County Ambulance Authority provides ambulance service in South Charleston. They do huge uh, numbers of calls right here in the city of Charleston. They exclusively do all the work in every town except Charleston, and they cover the whole county. We to lose that? No, I don't think so. Now that will be a problem with me. That's my biggest concern. Normally, it wouldn't bother me to let people decide on this, but if they decide on it, and then later they say, oh, my taxes went up, and then they vote no on the, can you imagine if we lost the KRT? Now, now there's this misnomer that all they do is drive around with empty buses. Um, uh, Paul's looked at that half a dozen times when someone claims that. Uh, somehow, if they're riding around with empty buses, they snuck about, what, 700,000 people in between the air on those buses. They haul a huge amount of people. It is a huge driver of this community. Do you um, feel like they're operating efficiently, that they have the buses running at the, in the times and places where they need to be? Well, I'll operate probably like you all do with the paper. Mm -hmm. If things, when the paper's late, you don't have to worry. You get that recording down here. You know, there's been a delay in circulation. And, you know, be patient. When, when things like that happen and it's off kilter, I get the phone calls. I've, I've made a career mistake to answer my phone and return phone calls. <laughs> and when I get those calls, I know. I get very little calls on that. I get almost no calls complaining about the ambulance authority, although sometimes we do. I haven't looked into, and frankly, most of them are a uh, miscommunication most of the time. People uh, understandably are stopped. Well, imagine if we had ambulances sitting around every at the same 